and so um, uh, I don't think anyone has submitted the exam yet, and that's okay. Um, please, you know, get it in by midnight. Um, not looking for perfect scores, right? You, uh, and yeah, it's taken a while. Yeah, yeah, 11:59 uh, p.m. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it takes a while, um, but you know, you don't have to be perfect, but but get something like something partial is much much better than nothing, right? Um, number three, ah, okay. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, the uh, wait, I, I lost some of those. Those came by too fast. I gotta switch back to this. Um, yeah. Um, I've tried to catch all of them, and and I have uh field tested all of them. Um, but they're yeah. Do, so they should be working. If you have questions, um, you are still welcome to ask me um about them. But again, remember something. Getting in something is better than nothing. Um, uh. Sorry, I'm just sending out this email. Do, do, do. Yeah. Um, for number three, a lot of it is just re is identifying the physics that's involved. So again, like if you've got questions after class um, and you're just trying to identify, figure out, well, how do I make the connection from these quantities he's given? Um, you know, feel free to kind of like probe in an email to me. Um, that's what I'm here for. Uh, yeah. Um, so if you want to pick up a little bit of extra credit beyond what's available on the exam, um, come to Physics T. It's, you know, low stakes, just hang out, chat with professors. Totally awkward, but in a, in a good natured way. Um, last week we had some um, uh, admitted students who visited. I don't necessarily think we'll have any this week. But um, so you can e let your guard down even more. Um, <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> do take a look for Friday at the warm up. Um, and I moved back some of the other assignments. Um, we're going to have one fewer uh, homework assignment in the semester than planned, um, or maybe it's two fewer right now. I can't even remember. Um, and that's OK. Still dropping uh, homework as described in the sil syllabus. So again, you don't have to be perfect. Um, your lowest score doesn't count. Um, so yeah, that's that. We're good with that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So last time, I mean, last time it was really big because we had like, what, we, there were like five students, five faculty, six, uh, and plus a staff member. So that was six people. Plus we had like, I think four or five, I can't remember, uh, students. So yeah, it was 15 plus people. Um, so we'll, 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 I don't know. We'll, we'll figure out a way to do it. In the past, we've oftentimes been more like six or seven people. So that's why I want more. I want to see y'all. Um, so let's start in with a lesson, though. Um, we're, uh, we just talked about electromagnetic waves last class as they hit a uh, surface at normal incidence. Let's take a look at what happens if they come in at some other angle. Right? You don't have to hit the surface uh, dead on. Um, and this is really, this is where things start to get interesting because now we're going to not just see, oh, if there's a change in material, you get a reflection um, and, and, and some transmission. But now we start getting into to optics, like what happens to the wave? Where does it go? Um, okay. <laughs> Thanks, Camille. Um, I hope he's okay, too. Um, yikes. Uh, uh, cool. Um, let me start off with the picture again of um, what's going on here. We're going to set it up. We're going to do like we did last time, where we set up. Um, oh, I'm. We we just set up what the waves are in the two different media. So remember, we've got um, this medium right here. Um, do do do. Yeah. Or is it growing near the roof? Inquiring minds want to know. Oh no. Oh, in the windstorms? Yikes. E. I hope there wasn't any major damage. Yikes. Yeah. 
E. All right, so th this line right here is our normal line, that dotted line. Um, we're going to have our wave come in like this. And I'm going to give that, it's got a wave number, but also the direction is indicated by making it a wave vector. And then this angle right here is going to be the angle of incidence. And then we get some that reflects off. And I'm going to draw it in a way, because well, I already kind of know the answer to this. right? But we're going to actually establish how it, how it comes off here. So this is going to be the reflected wave vector. That's supposed to be an R, K sub R for reflection. right? And it comes off at some angle like that. Right? And then some of it gets transmitted. And again, how I'm drawing it partly depends on me knowing the answer already. But we'll establish that some more coming up. So there's my transmitted um, wave number. So that's K sub T. Right? And this is the tr transmitted angle. So notice all these angles are measured from the normal. Right, from that dotted line that's perpendicular to the surface. Um, and there was something else I was going to say about that. Are those, yeah, they're supposed to be lowercase k's. My, my apologies. So here, I'll try to, whoop. We're going to reserve capital k's. Well, we're going to have other things that look kind of like capital k's later on. These are supposed to be lowercase k's, like our wave number. So again, k, lowercase k, the wave number is uh, 2 pi over lambda. Um, so, all right, so this sets up our situation. And once again, here, I'm going to extend the normal out this way. We're going to call that the Z direction, though. Um, so the normal is going to lie along Z, and we're going to call the interface for now Z equals zero, right, is the interface. Um, so we're still going to deal with um, b b monochromatic plane waves. And we're going to have it coming in from the left. Again, just we could choose our axes, you know, however we want. This is just going to be for consistency, so we can make a comparison to what we've already done. Um, so let's write down the three different waves that we've got here. So the first one is, whoa, I do this up here. I don't know why. Right. I've got our incident wave. I don't know. Here, I'll get rid of that. Um, we've got our incident wave. It is a vector, though. But we're going to use our complex functions to describe it so that we can make the math easier, describe amplitude and phase. And so um, <clears throat> we are going to describe its amplitude and polarization with a vector amplitude. And that's still complex. It's complex because we've absorbed the phase constant, the e to the i delta, into that complex amplitude. So what that leaves then is our oscillating part, e to the i. And since we're not just going in the z direction, right, we've got k. k and we got to pay attention because we're dealing with vectors. I can't just say k1 and k2 and just put a minus sign to indicate the direction, whether it's reflected or not. We really have to specify specifically the incident, reflecting, and transmitted wave vectors. We dot it with r right, to get the oscillations in space, and then minus omega t. And remember, once again, the um, phase that we often see in the k dot r minus omega t plus delta, that phase has been absorbed into the complex amplitude. So it's there. It's just hidden in that e naught incident tilde. Um, and then we can write our incident magnetic field. Whoops, that's supposed to be a tilde. Just show it's complex. Right. And I could write it out exactly the same way, but actually what we can do is write it as 1 over V1, 
the incident direction. So I can write that as k incident hat. That's supposed to be an i there. Um, cross with the, this incident wave like that. And so a couple things, right? This gets the direction correct. It's perpendicular to, by using the cross product, we've made the magnetic field perpendicular both to the direction of propagation, but also to the electric field. And then we get, by using the uh, unit vector for the direction though, and then a one over V1, we get the appropriate amplitude. And V1 is real, the unit vector obviously is real right here. So we see that we haven't altered the phase. So the magnetic field is still in phase. And that stuff we had done all before, taking a look at you know, fields inside of matter. Sure, that still holds, right? So that's the first thing, right? That's our incident wave. We also have to have a reflected wave. Uh, yeah. Right, and so for that, um, same thing, we're gonna write a complex vector. T like that. In terms of a complex vector amplitude. I've got a scooch, I'm getting too far away from my pen. Uh, oh, and so now we got to put the oscillating term. So it's an e to the i. Now we've got the reflected wave vector. Take the dot product with r minus omega t. Cool. And I'm going to do uh, something similar with our magnetic field. So I'll just write over here. Question mark, is there a tilde and a vector symbol over the B and E? Yeah, yeah, so these are vector fields, but they're also complex vectors, right? So the complexness, right, really just affects their, their amplitude. It makes it so they have a complex amplitude, um, but they um, it doesn't change their direction. But it makes it a little bit tricky because we have to, you know, we're used to visualizing, we've got a vector in three dimensions, but it's, Usually we, t we, we were used to drawing the complex uh, numbers in two dimensions. And so we, we, don't, we, can't, we don't really have that ability. It's getting kind of hard to visualize all these things, but yeah. Could we visualize this on a complex plane? So if we, if we knew, if we had the, um, um, if we align one axis for the direction of propagation and another axis for the direction of the vector, then we could have the perpendicular axis, a third axis be like a complex component of it or something like that. But the problem is that really only gives us, that doesn't, we can't fully embed that in a vector in three dimensional space, right? And, and here we've got really propagation in three dimensions. And so the vector can point the, the field can point in three dimensions. And I haven't actually gone so far as to draw the electric and magnetic field vectors on here, because we're gonna actually first deduce some properties of them before we start to draw them in. One thing we do know is that they are perpendicular to each other and to the wave vector for each of these waves right here. So yeah, it, it's getting increasingly difficult to visualize it for arbitrary cases, right? We need basically more dimensions than, than we can have. Um, if we knew exact, if we knew the direction it was going, and and just fix that as one as one of our axes, fix the direction that the thing was pointing as the other axis, um, then we could use the third direction to 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 include the phase information. But right, we were trying to do this so that it can go in any direction and and, and point in any direction. So we're ah, a little bit stuck. Um, so um, so uh, Nate's asking, is K for the reflected uh, wave negative because it's going the opposite direction? And, and the answer is no. In this case, right, we're going to use a full vector nature of it. So it's not just straight up going the opposite way, but you're onto something there, right? The Z component of K has to, of K reflected has to be negative. We know that much, but we, we also want to be able to say something about the X and Y components, right? Um, and that, so that's a little bit more complicated. We'll get to it, I promise. Uh, here, all right, so I'm gonna just write down 
So for this one right here, this, oops, this is equal to, it's, we're still in medium one right here. Um, and same rule, the reflected unit wave vector crossed with the electric field. complex electric field like that. And then we can do the same thing for the transmitted. Um, we just have, we're going to see one difference, right? It's going to look exactly the same analogous or not exactly the same analogous, exactly analogous transmitted. So it's a vector and it's complex. It's a function of coordinate and time. Uh, Supposed to be a T vector tilde. So, so that is complex amplitude and polarization right there. Um, e to the I. Again, it's going to be K transmitted. And let's see what happens with B. B is going to be a little bit different. So, this is the reflected up there. This one's our transmitted magnetic field. And now, so one difference is now where the transmitted wave is in medium two. So it's one over V2, the speed of the waves in medium two. And then take the cross product of its wave vector with the electric field. Vector tilde. Cool. All right, so we can see like it's, it's similar things, but we need to have uh, it's similar relationships for all three waves, but we have to write them out with separate amplitudes and separate phases and separate separate wave numbers. Um, so one thing we have um, though is like we've talked about before for the upper right B O. My, yeah, that's supposed to be capital R. A little bit clearer now. Um, that was pretty ugly. Um, so, right, they all have the same frequency. Again, we would have discontinuity, the wave wouldn't propagate um, if you had different frequencies at different points. So we can write that omega is K incident times V1 It's also, it's also equal to um, K reflected also times V1 because that's in medium one still. And then we've got the ref transmitted wave number times V2. All those are equal. So one of the things we could do is let's just divide through by um, V1 is common to most of them. Right? And so now we can have a relationship between these different wave numbers. Our incident wave number is, we can see is gonna be equal to our reflected wave number. The number, not the vector though, right? Um, we still have to come up with a relationship for their directions. And then we have a relationship for the transmitted wave number in terms of their relative speeds. And actually our speeds are inversely proportional to our indices of refraction. So I could write this as N1 over N2, sorry, um, times KT also. Okay. So we still have the exact same relationship, the exact same change in wavelength proportional to their speeds that we did previously. Cool, that's all the same. Um, so here's the thing, if you look over here at all these electric fields and magnetic fields, so all six of them so far, um, here. Every E and B, and actually, and if we write it in terms of electric displacement, and our H, right? All those things, they all have this format. They are 
something, 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 right? This could be vectors and complex. That's a whole bunch of scribble, right? It's just a bunch of stuff times e to the i oh, k dot r. That's an r minus omega t, right? And when I have k there, right? Right here, this could be the incident or the reflected or the transmitted one for all those things there. Um, so we're going to draw on that fact. We're actually going to look at the at, at relationships without paying any attention to all the amplitudes that are out front. And we're going to derive a whole bunch of stuff that has to do with waves. And it's actually going to be independent of the fact that they're electromagnetic waves to begin with. Okay, so we've got a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of stuff uh, times that oscillating term. So here it's right e naught i incident vector and complex. Right here it's one over v one, and we change the direction of it right here, and then you get the e naught i, and then but then for all of them there's always this oscillating term right here. Um, so here I'm going to quickly take a snapshot. No, why did you do that to me? It messed up. Okay. Okay, cool. I'm going to erase it. We'll come back to these ideas and, and some we're going to refine that sketch uh, before we go. All right, so um, remember, all right, so I'm just going to always say again, whoops. Fields. Everything is in this format right here. And so what, when we've got those three fields, or six fields, right, three different waves, each with uh, electric and magnetic field, or also D and H, um, uh, we combine them all to have um, boundary. We combine them and reconcile them all with the boundary conditions. Whoa. Um, So I'm going to often I'm going to be writing those as BC boundary conditions, right? not not any other thing that that might stand for. Um, boundary conditions, all the boundary conditions, like whatever you know, we had the boundary conditions for the electric field and the um, magnetic field, the perpendicular and the parallel components at the boundary, right? How we relate them. So we had you know four different ones. Um, uh, for all of them, though. Right, we've got whatever the field is on left. Whoa, something crazy just happened there. Equal to, there might be, this is a different something, 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 but we do some function, right? Some proportionality could just be one times the field on the right. Um, so let's write that out. Let's see what that looks like for our arbitrary field, right? Right, so when I say any, this is type of, for any type of field, right? So on the left-hand side, we've got something, something, something 
times e to the i k incident dot r minus omega t plus a bunch of other coefficients. Could be vector, could be complex. See, that's a new formal symbol, scribble, scribble, scribble. Right? And that's going to be equal to, and so the, my scribble, scribble, scribbles here absorb both the, or a combination of both this scribble and also this scribble. It doesn't matter. They're just scribbles. They've got their coefficients, vector, complex, scalar, all mixed together. Uh, okay, and so then we have to put in our transmitted field. I actually find this really, really like liberating and empowering, like without even worrying about the details of the fields, we can glean universal behaviors from them. That's pretty cool. Um, you're like, what? Um, so again, the constants, the amplitudes, um, polarization, uh, phase factor. But for all of them, there's no time or space dependence, right? It was just epsilons or mu's or v's or, you know, k cross, k hat cross, right? But they're just constants. Might be complex vector constants, but just constants, right? Right, that time and space dependence are only in the exponentials. And so that means like if we vary time and space, then those exponentials have to vary together because the equation has to hold at all points on the boundary and at all times. Not just not at all points, at all points on the boundary, right? Right, so that's X and Y. All right, so first thing is, right, the time part must be equal. Like any time variation must be the same. This must be the same. Right, that's why we have to have the same omega for all three of those waves. Otherwise, right, as you let time pass, they would start to change by different amounts. And so even if our boundary conditions held at one point, the different variations on the different terms would break that. Um, so let's do some other things. Um, let's see some other stuff that we have to do. Um, so that's the first part we, we learned is that, you know, the boundary conditions um, being in this format tells us tells us that we have to have the same omega. Um, the next thing, so here, I'm just gonna actually put a box around this if I can. Uh, so what that means then is, all right, this, time variations uh, 
the same across all three terms. And at the boundary, at z equals 0, the space variation is the same. for all three terms. And so what that means then is that <laughs> this, if those exponentials are the same, that means that their exponents must be the same. And we've already factored out the common e to the uh, i minus i mega t. We've said that's the same for all of them. So that means that this part here must also be the same, the k dot r. And that's going to have implications for us, too. OK. Um, do, uh, I didn't leave myself enough space. So I'm going to uh, save this and continue on a fresh slide right here, right? So OK, so l let's just re recover that bit right there. We just saw that. Oh, k i dot r equals the reflected wave factor dot with r equals k t dot r at z equals zero. Right. That's the interface. Right, and so um, we can write that out actually. So we know that z equals 0. So in the r, in this dot product, the z component, z is equal to 0 for our position where we're doing, where this holds. So when, as we evaluate these, we don't have to worry about the z component. Instead, we get x times k i x component. That's the x component plus y times ki's y component equals, we're going to do the same thing for the reflected wave number. The y component. And that's the same with our transmitted components, too. Um, so we've got the, these things right here, and that's looking kind of crowded. That, uh, those are R's. This is supposed to be an R. That's not necessarily helping. That's an R. That's an R. Okay, and this is an R. I know it looks like some sort of ugly V or something too. Um, all right, so we've got these things right here. So then the other thing we can say, though, is that um, there we also know that the x and y are independent. Right? We could go to a different posi x position, right? and the equality still has to hold. So what that means is the x the terms with x must all be equal. And then separately, the y terms must be equal to each other. Right? And so with, so for the x terms, we can factor out a common factor of x, and so we get ugh, the, pardon me, the x component 
of this wave vector is equal to the x component of this wave vector equal to the x component of this wave vector. And likewise, the y component of this one equal y component of the reflected waves wave vector and also for the y component of the transmitted ugh, my apologies transmitted nope wrong thing Right. So what does that mean? That the so what changes actually? What this here tells us is that only the z component changes. Because right, we derive this at the boundary, but once as the wave is coming incident wave is coming into the boundary as the reflected or wave leaves the boundary is transmitted, wave leaves the boundary, their wave vectors don't change. So we've established that at the boundary, they've got all that have the same X components, all have the same Y components. So that means throughout their propagation, both forwards, but also previously in time, they had the same X components, the same Y components. What changed was their Z components, all right? And so, Let's do a couple things. So let's actually make it so that um, we can now choose our axes, right? The one special axis is the z-axis, right? That's the direction perpendicular to the interface. That's our normal direction, right? We can make our choices of our x and y. Um, so let, to make life easier, here. So let's make it so that the incident wave vector lies in the xz plane. So another way to say that is that's y equals zero. Right. So the wave vectors only have x and z components. Just we've chosen them that way, right? Um, Right. And so what that says, though, right, we don't have any other change in, we don't pick up any additional Y components because all their Y components of their wave vectors um, uh, are the same. So what that means then is that K sub R, reflected wave vector, and the transmitted wave vector are also in that plane. And so we can actually put that all together. So we can say then that this incident wave vector, the reflected wave vector, the transmitted wave vector, and also that normal vector that we drew, the dotted line on the, on the diagram on the first uh, slide, right? So that's our interface normal. They're all in the same plane. That's an M. So we give that a name, right? All 
right? That was kind of implicit in the drawing that I drew to start with, right? But it's not necessarily obvious, right? That you've got, you send in your incident vector, right? And all you have to do is take a plane defined, oh, that's not at all what I wanted to do. All you have to do is take a plane defined by that incident vector and the normal to the surface. Those two things right there are sufficient. Um, you know that the reflected and transmitted wave vectors, their rays, will also lie in that same plane. They're not going to come in and then twist off into a third dimension. Right? Everything stays two-dimensional once you've defined it with the in incident wave and the normal. Right? So that's kind of cool. Um, what else? Oh, so let's actually, let me re really quickly redraw that uh, diagram Boo, kind of schematically. Right. So here's our interface like that. Right. Um, Here's my normal, right? Here is the incoming wave, right? And here's the outgoing wave that's reflected. Ah. So here, incident reflected. Ooh, that doesn't work. And here's the transmitted wave. Whoop. Right. Um, and one final thing, right? Remember, we called that the angle of incidence. There's the angle of reflection. There's the angle of transmission right there. So <laughs> this right here was our z direction. We chose our axes so that this right here is the x direction and the y direction. So everything's lying nicely in the plane of your screen. First part, nice, convenient. Um, next part is we can actually go back and revisit um, the boundary condition, specifically the fact that our x components are all equal to each other, right? So the x component of this, if we take a look over here, is going to be um, whatever this, if the wave vector, right, lies along the, the ray of the incoming wave, then the x component is vertical in this diagram. So that's actually the magnitude times the sine of the angle, right? Because we're measuring the angle yeah, it's opposite, right? The X is vertical in the diagram. So, you know, we always kind of default to being X having a cosine. That's when X, the X axis is horizontal in our diagrams and we're measuring from it that way. Um, so <clears throat> here, let me summarize what I just said. The X component right there coming from, from to, the, just to the left of that is equal to the magnitude of the wave vector times the sine of the angle of incidence, right? Um, and similarly for R and T, right? So what we can say then is that our incoming wave number times sine of our incident wave angle, the angle from normal is equal to the reflected wave number times sine of the angle of reflection and times our transmitted wave number times sine of the angle of transmission. Right. So angle of incidence, angle of reflection, angle of transmission. Ah, but right in our material, in material one, right, um, we've got the same speed. So we've got, Right, we've got the two wave numbers are equal to each other because they're both in the same material, right? So what that means then is that the sine of the angle of incidence is equal to sine of angle of reflection. And what that 
means then is that the angle of incidence has got to be equal to the angle of reflection. Woohoo, fun too, right? Right? Fun too? That is the law of reflection. But you hit a surface. Ah, Snell's law. You, you just stepped on the punchline. No, no, you, that, that was a perfect introduction, right? This is the law of reflection. So we built up to this thing. Yeah, which we told you like, oh, you can get it empirically and just say, hey, every time I've looked at light, I've seen angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. But we, but here, what, what we're seeing is this is actually true. We've done this. Remember, this was true for waves that were described by squiggle, squiggle, squiggle times e to the i k dot r minus omega t. So this is true for every single wave hitting uh, an interface between materials or between depths for water waves, anything like that, any kind of reflection, you'll get angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. And then, right, so that was just talking about these two, the equality between the angle of incidence and the angle, I'm sorry, between the incident terms here and the reflected terms. But let's take a look at the relationship between incident terms and the transmitted terms. And that indeed is going to be, <clears throat> lead to our law of refraction, right? So let's take a look now. K sub i times sine of the angle of incidence is equal to the transmitted wave number times the sine of the angle of transmission right there. So we can do a little bit of rearranging. Let's gather our signs together, sine theta t over sine. Oh, wait, what do I want? Uh, or sine theta i is gonna be equal to k sub i over k sub t. Sure. A little bit more constructive way to do this, right? Right. Remember um, that our wave numbers are going to be here. Uh, here. I'm going to just write over here. Omega equals k v, which is equal to k c over n. So our wave numbers are going to be proportional to our index of refraction. Because omega stays the same and c is a constant, right? So I can take this right here and write, rewrite it this way, sine of theta t divided by sine of the angle of incidence. It's just equal to index of refraction of material one divided by index of refraction of material two, right? That is noteworthy, right? right. That's our law of refraction that is in optics. Snell's law. It's nice to give things descriptive names instead of naming them after people, particularly since the person that they're named after often isn't the first person to have discovered it, as in Snell's case. But the important point right here is, again, this is true not just for light, right? We learned it in the context of light, but this is going to be true for sound waves going from one material to another, for water waves, even for quantum mechanical matter waves. So, I don't know, th that, that's pretty awesome. Definitely got to snapshot this. Cool. All right. 
So yeah, kind of crazy, right? Stuff that you just kind of took from or granted for light and fun too, but we've just done something a lot more powerful. We have derived it for all waves. Let's go back specifically to E, what? yeah, to, to E and M. Like, I, I want you to appreciate that. And that's why I went through all these derivations and so on, um, is, is that first of all, to, sh to show you, witness the power of, of, of actually, you know, this exponential description, but look also see the universality of these treatments. And that's why we're learning about this stuff, not just because light's useful and, 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 and all that, but we can do all kinds of stuff with this. Um, all right, cool. So let's go now and, and apply the electromagnetic wave boundary conditions. EMBC, electromagnetic boundary conditions? Yeah. Electromagnetic boundary conditions would take me like half a minute to write out otherwise. Um, all right, so let's write them out. And so I'm just gonna go straight to them. Uh, and so these were um, for linear media, linear and homogeneous, right, but they're still, a boundary between the two media, but they're linear and homogeneous. So we can talk about medium one having a single um, permittivity, right? And this boundary condition came from our electric displacement, but electric in our linear medium, we can turn that, relate that directly to our electric fields. So we'll do that. That's supposed to be a tilde. This is the Z component. And I'm gonna, I'll talk about, you know, again, reinforce where this came from. So this is E2. So a couple things, right? This is perpendicular to the interface. Right, so this is the coming from, uh, when we're talking about the Z component right here, we're talking about the term, about the boundary condition that had to do with the perpendicular fields, right? Um, and why do we specifically have just the amplitudes, the E naught, um, could factor out the temporal variation. We have Z equals zero. And it also has to hold for all X and Y, right? So we can factor out all the vari varying parts and then we relate just the amplitudes then. And, and actually, we're going to evaluate it at a particular x and y. So, uh, so we could factor out the e to the i k x times x, and and the same thing for y. Okay. So there's our boundary conditions from our our perpendicular electric field boundary condition. So let's do another one for our perpendicular magnetic field, which is gonna be equal on either side of the boundary. Vector tilde plus B naught reflected vector complex. And we're gonna take the Z component likewise. All that right there. So now we can move on to the parallel fields. Um, so let's do 
for the parallel fields, they have to be equal. The boundary conditions have to control for the have to hold component by component, right? If two vectors are equal to each other, then their x components are equal and their y components are equal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the boundary condition for the parallel components are. Right, this is, I'm going to add the fact that it's a parallel component in just a moment. moment. Um, but specifically, actually, what I'm going to do is say, let's do this for x. Uh, right. And then we're going to do the exact same thing for the y component. All right, so I've just decomposed it into X and Y components. Oops, there's a vector in there. All right, and so again, oops. parallel to the interface. Right, so both of these were perpendicular to the interface, right? And both of these are going to be parallel to the interface, this one and the next one. Okay, so here we've got the magnetic field boundary condition. So the parallel components are related with the constant proportionality from the permittivity. That's a tilde. Vector tilde. Right, and we'll do the x component separately from the y component. E not t. And here, how about this? Got a one over mu one, just so you don't have to write all that out. The y component. Cool. So we've got these boundary conditions. Uh, so we're going to set this up. I'm not going to finish the story today. This story is going to continue into Friday. Um, but um, let's get it set up so that we're ready to try some stuff with this um, for this class, for next class, I mean. Um, mm -mm -mm. Um, yeah, cool. All right, so All right, so really quickly, snapshot. Yeah, all right, so I'm not going to, um, what I'm going to do is take a snapshot and get us and introduce the ideas, but I'm not going to start in on the derivations because that would be crazy. Uh, I, I don't want to break them up between this class and next. Um, but what they're going to do is give us a whole bunch of even more powerful insights, uh, actually quantitatively relating uh, amplitudes and phases um, more, even more than the angle of reflection and angle of refraction. Um, Okay, cool. so let me draw the two possible situations. So once again, I'm going to have to redraw this diagram. Um, eh. Right, so there's my interface. Um, Here is the normal. 
that's z, this is x, z equals zero right there, height. Let's draw one wave coming in and I'm going to notice when I did this before, I you know, knew the answer. I knew that the angle of incidence was equal to the angle of refraction, so I drew those you know, as close to symmetrical as I could. And then, finally, the angle of transmission, the angle of refraction, can be something different, though, right? And what has changed, though, not the x and y components of the wave vectors, but just the z component of the wave vector. But that stretches it along the z direction, and so that can change the angle. Right? So here, once again, is our incoming, our incident wave vector. Here is our outgoing, our reflected wave vector. And here is the transmitted wave vector. And so now we can, we've got, we know that our electric field, our magnetic field must be perpendicular to each of these uh, wave vectors. So when we describe the waves, we've got our polarization anywhere in that plane perpendicular to each of those. But now, you know, so we could write it however we wanted to, but now we've got a special plane of incidence, right? And so we can take our polarization vector and we can actually break it down into is it lying in the plane of incidence or is it perpendicular to the plane of incidence? And then any other polarization can be written as a linear combination of those two. Right. These have weird names in optics, p-polarized and s-polarized. They come from German words. Why? I don't know. That's just the way they are. Um, I'm going to stick with Griffiths and use the descriptive uh, description. And so here, I'm, what we're going to do is here, I'm going to draw up here. this situation right here. So <laughs> what that means is the electric field lies in this plane, right? It's got to be perpendicular like this. And that means then that the magnetic field, so here's my E incident, right? And then I'm going to go, I should have left more space. There's my E reflected. Here is my E transmitted. And then, um, oh man, I'm going to change colors just because, right? I'm going to have B is going to be whoop, coming up. This is supposed to be like perspective out of the plane, right? So it is perpendicular as well. So there's B. And likewise, B here. We'll just draw it like that. There's B coming out of the plane. B coming out of the plane. Whoops, that's supposed to be B. OK, 
Okay, so this is the case that we're going to look at. Um, what we're going to, um, and and in fact, the other case you can. I'm. We're not going to. Neither Griffiths nor I are going to go through and derive it all the way through. We're going to let you do that. But what the goal there is basically just to mimic the steps, mimic the processes that you go through for the derivation that we're going to do in the next class to see what happens to these waves, right? Um, again, I'm going to do it for the parallel to the plane of incidence, the p-polarized, and you will, in a homework assignment, get to do it for the s-polarized, perpendicular to the plane of incidence. You'll get different results, but you will follow through the same logical mathematical steps invoking the same physics. Is that, I don't, is that a sarcasm, the slash there? Slash, yeah. It is actually, right, it's, it's, it's worthwhile. It's, it's, it, um, I don't know. So, as you can see, I get kind of happy about um, this, uh, stuff right here because we're taking stuff that's you know we're taking these rules that were all kind of abstract and dry and we're turning them into very very rich behavior um, that has all kinds of applications it ties back into stuff you've done before but extends it and and you and you know by using these mathematical abstractions connects it to all kinds of phenomena too um, where you didn't learn it specifically um, and so we're getting into the realm where like we're there are all kinds of technological applications um, for this um, so fun stuff um, but yeah it means using some kind of complicated math at times uh, so one thing um, I'm going to ask you to do for next class, speaking of technology, um, for next class, and I'll, I'll send you a reminder, if you can, please bring, um, so for um, Nate and Camille, bring a, your polarizer um, from Advanced Lab. For those of you who aren't in Advanced Lab, which is most of the class, um, if you happen to have polarizing sunglasses, bring those. If you don't, that's fine. We'll just talk about it, right? But it, um, yeah, that'll be a start. Sound good? So it's not just equations. One or two pairs of sunglasses. Ah, uh, Harry's getting, you can bring, if you've got two, all the better. We, you can get by with just one. Yeah. Uh, using two, we can explore some other things that you can do with polarizers. But we're going to take a look at polarization with reflections and stuff like that. Um, and again, Nate and Camille, this relates directly to the advanced lab stuff that we're doing too. Um, but we're going to learn some of the, the reasons and the math behind it too. Brewster's angle, yes. Ha <laughs> ha. Good stuff. Cool. All right, folks. Um, do you, you know, take advantage, ask me questions on the exam if you need to. Um, yeah, is it, what do you have a, a question about, Camille? Is it something for everyone, or do you, should we, do you want to stick around and talk about it uh, in a minute or so? All right, see you, Nick. For everyone, okay, yeah, Camille, what's, go, what's up? I'm going to multitask really briefly while you ask. Oh, yeah, who's taking quantum next year? Derek, I suspect Nick is, but he... cool. So a whole bunch of y'all. Do you have specific questions about it? That's all you want to know. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, quantum is a, is an so these upper level classes, quantum mechanics. Um, uh, e and M statistical mechanics, they all, um, one of the things about them and, and also, um, uh, mechanics, right. Is this whole other level of mathematical abstraction. So it's describing things that sometimes we can't even see less so for mechanics, but, um, using math, but it is really, really powerful and lets you do all kinds of cool stuff. So quantum mechanics. 
should be fun. The world is statistic. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so the other thing is, when you, in quantum mechanics, once you get past the spins kind of stuff and you start talking about uh, spatial wave functions, um, you can make all kinds of connections back to this chapter, chapter nine in EM. And you'll see a lot of very relevant stuff. You'll be using wave number, you'll be looking at reflection and transmission. Um, when you have a, a, a change uh, in the potential that your wave function moves in, lots and lots of parallels. And of course, lots and lots of complex numbers and uh, excuse me, abstraction in that sense. So quantum mechanics is good, EM is good. The overlap and the commonalities of, of the tools, that's where things are really, that's where you take your physics education and realize, hey, I can use math to do all kinds of stuff. Not just like quantum mechanics, e &M over here, but like whew, everything. Maybe not everything, but lots of stuff. Okay, cool. I will see you all um, on hopefully Thursday, physics team, but if not, on Friday. Um, but feel free to reach out with questions.